I turn to acting and performance and expression, self-expression, to understand things about myself. The act of expression is healing. Hi, my name is Jake Gyllenhaal, and this is the timeline of my career. I'm not really sure how I decided to get into acting at such a young age. I think it was probably a mixture of the attention that I ended up getting through mimicry at the dinner table, mixed with knowing people in the movie industry and being a bit of a clown. I just sort of fell into it because it just brought me joy. I happened to be uh, friends with the Crystal family. I don't know how it happened because I was pretty young, but I was asked if I wanted to audition for City Slickers. So I did, and then I was asked to fly to Billings, Montana to meet with Ron Underwood, the director of uh, City Slickers. And I remember flying with my dad on a plane and getting to this cool hotel and being so excited, and then meeting with Mr. Underwood, and then while we were on our way to the airport being told that I got a part in this movie. I remember everybody being so sweet to me. There's a scene in the movie where I was showing everybody in between takes that I could dislocate my shoulder. Oh. 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 <laughs> Danny, Dan, come on, come on. He's in the gifted program. <laughs> and Billy Crystal said, oh, let's start the scene with that. That seems funny. So the whole scene starts with me popping my shoulder, double jointed arm, um, which is still double jointed. Doesn't uh, feel as nice now, but uh, <laughs> um, it actually gave me a real insight into how movies and how, even I know it sounds absurd, but how creativity is found. You move with the thing that is most original. And at the time that was most original. And it really set a tone actually for how I've approached a lot of different things and scenes from there on out to watch people like Bruno Kirby and Daniel Stern and Billy Crystal and watch them work and play. Um, and it really had a deep, deep, deep effect on me. When you're a teenager, you think you can do anything, and you do. Your 20s are a blur. 30s, you raise your family, you make a little money, and you think to yourself, what happened to my 20s? Watching a great comedian give a monologue that has become a classic monologue at that age, again, was like a masterclass. That movie had a real indelible uh, impact on me, and Billy Crystal signed a poster for me by the end of that, and he said uh, to Jake, um, thanks for letting me be in your first movie. Love, Billy. Um, and I still have that poster to this day. Seems now that I even have to check with the station manager if I want to wipe my nose. <laughs> Donnie Darko, it was my first movie that anyone sort of offered to me without an audition. I remember finishing the script of Donnie Darko. I closed it and I went, I don't know if I want to meet with this person. I wonder what they're like. <laughs> What's he going to be like? Like in a dark cloak, like hiding in a corner? I didn't know. and. So I sort of hesitantly went upstairs and there was this totally unassuming, really lovely, very kind, just regular guy. And he was like, hey, you know, uh, let me play some of the music from that I'm thinking about putting in the movie. And, uh, and, you know, we really want to make this. And I was like, oh, this guy's so nice. And the next day he offered me the movie. And so began what I would consider to be one of the most powerful experiences I've had in making a film. When I look at the cast of that movie now, when I look at what they've all done, where they've all gone, what they've all created, who they were at that time, it's just incredible. And it's the only time up until now, or hopefully a different soon, it may be a change, that I've acted with my sister. Anyway, I'm not gonna squeeze one out until I'm like 30. Will you still be working at the Yarn Barn? Because I hear that's a really great place to raise children. That's really funny. 
I think that's a movie about the unconscious, you know? It's a movie about the power of the unconscious and the power of growing up and what that means. And it's a, a thing that I think we don't give enough, I think, love and empathy and respect to that journey. There have been movies that have been made that have, but it's just one of them. The complications, the pain, the struggle of what it feels like to grow up. And why it struck me was that at the time, there were all these sort of high school films coming out that were all about, you know, your typical experience. And this to me was a expression of adolescence that was far from typical and somehow really felt more true to me. 28 days, six hours, 42 minutes. And inevitably, the end of that movie will bring up and has brought up so many different questions. And to me, that's a really successful story. My desire for a full stop ending resolution is intense. I love it. But I think in the end, um, what feels most true is the question mark. And so Donnie Darko is that. And I just like that it's a movie that messes with you a bit, you know? Um, and I think because it does, it has, it, has, it has stood the test of time. I loved making this movie. I made a lot of friends on this film that have been my friends now for, I guess, close to 20 years, you know? Roland saw me in a number of parts and he just said, you know, I think this guy's a talented guy and I want him to be in the movie. One of the things I remember about that film, which is just, I think it defines movie making and being an actor in movies totally, is that we were filming in Montreal in the dead of winter and Quebec winters are, not for a slouch, you know? Um, it was freezing. And yet we were shooting on a stage, massive stage, that was heated to 80 degrees. And then we were shooting in fake snow inside that stage, <laughs> pretending like we were freezing cold. Um, and that just sort of, just encapsulates the absurdity of what movies are and how you desperately need your imagination in order to make these things work, you know? And also I think there are these great moments of the size that a movie can be. Like the grand nature of making movies that is just so beautiful. And I remember walking on set and there being the front steps of the New York Public Library on a stage in Montreal and a water tank the size of, I don't even know, it was just a massive water tank with cars submerged to like up to their windows and a thousand extras and, you know, a machine that could make a fake tsunami. And I thought, this is just the best job. You know, the, the, the relationship I think between me and Heath while we were making this movie was something that was based on a profound love for a lot of people that we knew and were raised by in our lives and a deep respect for their love and their relationship. I mean, one of the things I really remember about the process after the movie came out was, um, Heath never wanting to make a joke, even as I think culturally, there were many jokes being made about the movie or poking fun at and things like that. And his consummate devotion to how serious and important 
the relationship between these two characters was. It showed me, I think, how devoted um, he was as an actor and how devoted he was, and we both were, to the story in the movie. And um, for us, the experience of the movie, I can say, was a really deep and fun one. We spent three weeks shooting, um, waking up in the morning, making everyone coffee, and then eating a little breakfast and walking to work. Um, it's a technique of movie making that I wish we did more of, you know, where we all just powwowed and lived together in a space. I wish I knew how to quit you. Then why don't you? Why don't you just let me be, huh? Because of you, Jack, that I'm like this. I'm nothing. I'm, I'm, just, I'm nowhere. Oh. There's so much to say about this movie. There's even more for me to say about my experience of it. There's even more for me to say about the reaction to it and what it meant and what happens when you realize as a performer in particular that something has nothing to do with you. That it is a story has the power beyond anything that you think you have control over or part of. The story is the power. And when it goes out into the world, it becomes everyone else's. And so you have a short time with it, and that's my job and my honor to do, and then it is everyone else's, and it is no longer mine. And there is no film that I've ever done that has shown that to me more than Brokeback Mountain. There is a moment that I go back to a lot. Heath and I were at a Q&A at the Arrow Theater in Los Angeles. And I remember us going to dinner while the movie was screening. And I remember us joking backstage. And I remember us kind of coming on to stage in a sort of humorous mode, you know, because we were just having fun with each other. And we sat down, the lights came up, and a man stood up, and the movie had been out for a week and a half. And he said, I just want to say, this is my 11th time seeing this movie and I can't stop watching it, and I just want to thank you all for making it. And I thought, 11 times in 10 days. <laughs> and we just, I remember that sort of, again, the wash of that over us. We're joking and we're, you know, we're poking fun at each other before we go on, and then the profound uh, realization of the profundity of this, this thing washed over us. It, it happens constantly to this day, and it's like, it's, I, I can't really express how, how proud I am of it. What if you and me had a little ranch somewhere, a little cow and calf operation? Be sweet like. And when is it gonna be finished? When you catch him, when you arrest him? Be serious. I am serious. I, I need to know who he is. I, I need to uh, stand there. I need to look him in the eye. And I need to know that it's him. I think every movie carries with it an energy. And when there's a decision to be in the world of this world, which is, you know, a pretty dark world, the cast, the crew, you carry that energy with you, you know? It, and and it's, a, it's a trying, intense story. Um, one that, you know, really took its toll on many people's lives, literally, quite literally, through the journey of the Zodiac Killer, and then afterwards in trying to search for this person. And I think for me, that energy was, was very intense. But also I think, you know, David Fincher is incredible. And his movies are some of the best ever made. There was a focus and intention that was I'd never experienced before, but also because we were working one of the first films that was really shot fully on digital. So he was in the process of making a film in a whole, with a whole nother technique and a whole nother process and dealing with so many imperfections in that process and trying to hone them in. So for a very detail-oriented filmmaker, 
as you're working with a new medium, though he had worked with it before, but to make a feature film with it. You know, there was a lot of trial and error. That was the film where I met the incomparable and extraordinary Robert Downey Jr. Have you considered the water theory? What? Geographically, every attack takes place near a, a body of water Those or water, water theory. Name, Lake Berryessa, mm -hmm. Blue Rock Springs, Lake Wash, Herman. Washington, Ontario. You think? No. I found myself sitting there sometimes like in awe of the actors that I was working with just watching them work. Okay, just one thing. Is it true they got a print off the cap? Yeah, they got a partial in blood. But that is not for publication. Oh, hey, hey, come on. Hey, it's me. Did he say they got a print? Partial. I was lucky that I was playing an observer. <laughs> um, and it was just one of those, I mean, it was just incredible, I mean, it was an incredible, another incredible experience. One where I learned a lot, a lot about filmmaking is a director's medium and it is all about their vision and you service that vision. And um, I know that and I saw that and learned that on that film. Can I help you? No. There was sort of uh, no escaping Lewis Bloom in a lot of ways. I've been searching for techniques. I spent a lot of time in the process of making films looking for how to act and how to do it, and if there was one way. And I totally immersed myself in Lou Bloom. These are three wealthy white people shot and killed in their mansion, including a suburban housewife shotgunned in her bed. I know you, Nina. I know your interest and excitement in this product is greater than the amount you're offering. It was a sort of successful experiment in that, but I think I came away from it realizing, I don't know if that's the way in which I want to do it always. I don't know if that's, to me, what acting is always about. I think it was hard to shake that experience. But when you have words like that, when you have a character like that, which rarely comes along. You saw him. I can't jeopardize my company's success to retain an untrustworthy employee. You're crazy. When you have writing like that, when you have someone who has written something that's so good, you'll give everything to it because it's so rare to find. And so I was just deeply devoted to that character and that story. And yeah, the, the side effects of it, it's like, yeah, you, you, it takes a bit of time to shake it off. But, you know, in the end, it's just acting. You need to show initiative. There is no better way to achieve job security than by making yourself an indispensable employee. Mr. Beck is from Earth, just not yours. There are multiple realities, Peter. This is Earth, Dimension 616. I'm from Earth 833. I'm sorry, you're saying there's a multiverse? What was interesting when I went to Spider-Man Far From Home was that I think I was, I, I'm pretty sure I was taking myself too seriously. I, I, in fact, I'm sure of it. I think I had really lost that sense of play and fun that I am, that, that sort of, that class clown that I talk about that found that idea of just popping a shoulder and making a funny face. It was such a cathartic thing to be able to throw out away all that seriousness and really become the actor that I think I've always wanted to be in a lot of ways. See, that wasn't so hard. <laughs> Somebody get this stupid costume off me! And find the play and the fun and the gratitude um, that I'm here and I get to do this. And oh my God, like, it's all about the family of making a movie. It's all about the experience that you have with the people you're making that film with. And I think that we go through journeys in our life where we're, you know, finding ourselves. And, and in the case of Spider-Man, I think I realized, hey, you know, acting is really fun.
You know, you, you know, let, enjoy it. And the people here are fantastic. Enjoy them and enjoy the life around you because life goes by super fast. I really am sorry. Why are you closed? Oh, we're just doing a transfer in the back. It's procedure. Okay. Worry me for a second. I saw you talking to yourself in the mirror. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was thinking about starting a savings account. <clears throat> oh, nice. We got some great junior accounts. I'll let you in in 20 minutes. You know what, though? Because uh, if I could just get it done real quick, because I'm on the clock, uh, promise not to rob the place. <laughs> Promise. What I find appealing is about dri the drive, the movement sometimes of a character. Are you active or are you passive a lot of times? What are you, what are you going towards? And I, I found that Danny Sharp was a character that, that sort of knew where he was going, was moving forward. And yeah, is, is wild and, and is, his intentions are always good, his actions are, you know, questionable in the bank robbery and in the, you know, chase sequences and things like that. But I. I like how much he loves his brother. I loved that about the script from the beginning. I don't know if it's always been to my advantage, but I fall in love with story before I fall in love with character. And the character is the execution of that story. But really it's about the story and being in the world of the filmmaker. I didn't realize how small that ambulance was gonna be and how many sharp edges there were gonna be in it, but I kept thinking about how much I loved reading the script and how entertained I was when I did. So it's weirdly for me, like much less about the character, even though we've talked about a lot of characters, than it is about the story. And if you go back, it's the stories that I'm always seduced by. And that's the thing that I love. Um, and so when you ask me about the consistency of characters I choose, it's actually the variation of the stories that I look at more than the characters themselves. At this point, it's really about play, and it's really about enjoying the people that I'm with. There are so many incredible people who make movies. I'm gonna hope for the future of my career is just to be able to keep doing things I love. If these past few years have taught us anything, it's just to be with people you love, enjoy them, enjoy our time, and that's what I'm gonna do, or at least try to.